when I was eight. I was confused at being called bossy because I wanted to direct the plays that we would put on for our parents. They would literally and symbolically cover their femininity with a veil because their femininity in the outside male world is seen as a disturbance, as even a threat because it brings chaos. Then an academic, a Nigerian woman, told me that feminism was not our culture, that feminism was an African, and that I was calling myself a feminist because I had been corrupted by Western books. Women are choosing not to identify as feminist. Why has the word become such an uncomfortable one? So I have this favorite video game. It's a little gem called Near Automata, and it's an experience that changed my life on its release. Nowadays, it's fairly well known, but did you know that when it first came out, it struggled to even sell a million copies in its first couple years? Seriously, I thought I was crazy for being infatuated with this title. I'm lucky enough to say that word of mouth has gone around far and wide enough that Nier has now gained worldwide popularity, with over 7 million copies sold, all thanks to mass praise from fans. But even still, I run into this issue. It's one that I forget about until someone says something and it's really weird. Whenever I try telling some of my friends to play this game, I'm met with a response of, you mean that game with Butt Girl and her slutty anime outfit? I thought that was a joke. To which I always have an aggressive internal response, but I don't know how to change their mind on this. How do you explain to someone that this game with Butt Girl is super philosophical and deep? that it poses existential questions that make you rethink your entire life, that it breaks the medium of being a video game in creative ways that almost no other game has done before. If those visuals on screen didn't do you any favors with what I was just saying, then I guess you see my point. How do you explain these aspects of the game without sounding utterly ridiculous when all they can see is butt girl? Hey, at least I have no trouble convincing them the gameplay is fun. But this issue isn't exclusive to Nier Automata. Just the other day, I recommended the Bayonetta series to a friend. It shares a lot of similar aspects to Nier Automata. Fun gameplay, awesome lore, lovable characters, and, well, lots of butt. It makes sense, actually. Bayonetta and Nier Automata were made by the same studio, Platinum Games. Of course I'd run into the same problem. As you'd expect, my friend said, isn't that the game where you play as a sl- And... Oh man, as someone who's played the Bayonetta trilogy, and especially after playing the Origins game afterwards, hearing my friends say this both surprised me and infuriated me. Not only is it so ignorant and disingenuous to refer to Bayonetta's character as a s as that's not how she is at all in her games, but sometimes I forget the stigma society puts on women and body confidence. Especially knowing that my friend definitely gets around, but when it's a woman, God forbid she own her own body. After sending him the trailers for the games, he sends me a screenshot back and says, Like this, isn't this a little on the nose? As the image loaded, I didn't know what to expect, but long story short, this is the screenshot he sent me. Just Bayonetta doing a cool pose? Her clothes not any more revealing than a swimsuit women in real life would wear? Fighting enemies. To me, and probably most women, there's nothing off-putting about this, but my friend just couldn't get over using this as an excuse not to play the game. To this day, he'll miss out on some of the best entertainment the industry has to offer, because apparently, badass woman in swimsuit bad. My personal stories regarding Bayonetta and Nier Automata are just a drop in the bucket. Systematic prejudice against body confidence, especially pertaining to women and femininity, is baked into our society like a deadbeat pan that you can't get all the grime off of. Seriously guys, stop using non-stick. It doesn't work. So let's take our time today to explore women in entertainment, how media has villainized femininity, and explore examples of how writers can portray feminine women positively. Now, I just finished rewatching the original Spider-Man trilogy on Disney+. Plus. I haven't seen these movies in years, but they've aged surprisingly well. Except for one aspect. Mary Jane. 
Now, I was kind of shocked at how old-fashioned this portrayal of Mary Jane was. These movies were from the early 2000s after all, so by that point plenty of progression had been made for how women are represented. I mean, we had things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Charmed, and Kill Bill, which made some of the biggest strides for female empowerment. And don't worry, we'll come back to those at some point, but Mary Jane in Spider-Man seemed to embody a helpless, love-struck girl whose only ambitions were purely selfish, no matter who she had to step on to get there. She toyed with Peter's emotions, used Harry for his money, and John when she couldn't get who she really wanted, knowing full well she would never take them seriously. And she clearly treated them as such too. She wanted to be famous, for no reason whatsoever other than to just gain fame, which in itself isn't terrible, but coupled with how she also treated the people around her in her life, it just paints a truly selfish figure. One that's backed by no individuality, no powerful characteristics, and no empathy. Mary Jane is a picture book definition of a mindless prize to be won by men and nothing more. This is the worst kind of female representation in my opinion because it's not accurate at all. I'm sure some people like this exist in real life, but it's certainly extremely rare. But what happens when a writer only fixes some of these tropes, and not all of them? Let's start with when the powerful aspect is fixed, but lack of individuality and empathy remain. These portrayals are typically hyper-feminine, cold-hearted, and part of a clique of sorts. Yeah, the best example of this is the mean girl herself, Regina George. Her lack of individuality leads her to be part of what are called the Plastics, a group of girls who also share her characteristics, albeit with even more caveats. She's a leader, sure, but she's always trying to be at the top of a homogenized ladder. This is a classic example of why most people associate femininity with villainy. Many characters have been made similarly to Regina, Sharpay from High School Musical, Season 1 Cordelia from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Corella Deville from 101 Dalmatians, and even Katie Heron herself later on in the same movie, when she loses her sense of identity, showing what happens when this one character flaw can take over. You are a mean girl! You're a Now, this villainous, femme fatale trope is at least a little more likely to exist in real life than, say, a Mary Jane, but even still, it's more of a caricature than a realistic character. Even the popular girl you have in your head from school isn't this mean. This, lacking in empathy. And if she is, then you have an unfortunate rare case on your hands and I'm really sorry. The most realistic aspect here though is Regina's lack of individuality. This is something that many people actually do struggle with, and characters like Cher from Clueless are much more realistic portrayals of a woman who does lack this trait. She's mostly caring for others, but not having individuality stems from her ignorance of the world around her, constantly saying things that showcase her lack of knowledge. But she is trying, because she cares, and if she were to ever be presented with the knowledge she needs, I have no doubt she would act on it accordingly. But you could also have the opposite problem, where the one character flaw is lack of empathy, while sense of identity and power are intact, such as the bride from Kill Bill. I mean, she used to have empathy, but that eventually went out the door. There is, however, the most common portrayal of the protagonist female. This character template typically only has one character flaw, lack of power. She's an empathetic woman who has a strong sense of identity. She doesn't care to be like everyone else. She stays in her own lane. And yes, in that sense, she is powerful, but that power remains on the inside. Outside, her social status is likely an outcast. Others view her in a negative or neutral light, and it's only when people take a decent amount of time to get to know her that she opens up and becomes desirable to them. And because that desirability has to be earned, these characters aren't really shown to be too feminine, as media swears femininity is tied to innate desire from peers. Examples of this character are many. Gabriella from High School Musical, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games, Hermione from Harry Potter, Ripley from Alien, Xena Warrior Princess, the list goes on and on. Seemingly forever. Matter of fact, this would be the biggest list in modern entertainment, and that's not exactly a bad thing. After all, these characters are very realistic. 
Many women do feel powerless, even with a strong sense of individuality and immense empathy. Just as it's the most common portrayal of women in entertainment, it's the most common example of a woman in the real world. Their rights are being taken away every day. Employers are shafting them for male cohorts, and powerful figures exploit them in horrendous ways for the promise of fame and fortune. Lack of power is a common, all too real obstacle women face. Sometimes a female character might fluctuate on which character flaw she's given at any given time though. Like Korra, an underrated character to be sure. Korra is constantly shown to gain and lose power, individuality, and empathy at different points in the series. This sort of constant fluctuation can be very entertaining to witness as it shows a character's struggle to maintain a general balance, which is fitting as the final season of the series is labeled Balance, and it sees Korra trying to balance, again, these aspects of herself so that she can be the best version of herself possible. Other great examples of this are Jessica Jones and Wanda Maximoff. I call these the character study characters. Though for Wanda, I don't really count the Doctor Strange 2 film. We'll just stick to WandaVision for her character study. So what happens when these character flaws are rectified? When a woman is written to have none of these character flaws? Well, wouldn't that be like not entertaining? I disagree. Actually, I think it just provides a rare case of inspiration. Let's bring this discussion back to Bayonetta, as I believe she's the perfect example of a powerful, positive, feminine woman. Bayonetta is hyper-feminine. As I mentioned, femininity is usually associated with power, but usually a villainous power. Bayonetta 1 even plays with this trope by making you think she's a villain for the first few chapters, because she never denies Luca's accusations that she killed his father. It's only later revealed that angels killed his dad Antonio, and Luca simply couldn't see them because he lacks the magical abilities to see different dimensions. Sounds complicated, you don't have to know all the details either way. This begs the question, why is femininity usually synonymous with power of some sort in modern entertainment? Well, Bayonetta makes it obvious for us. It's because, historically, women have been associated with femininity, but also historically oppressed. Look at your hair. Look at that blouse. And the way that skirt hangs. And those socks. You don't seem to be exactly the type to make this guy behave like a human being. In the case of Bayonetta, her fellow witches were condemned by the angels and hunted down by humans. They were essentially persecuted for being powerful women. So it's only natural that Bayonetta's response is to flaunt her body in the face of her enemies. Even in progressive, modern entertainment, feminine expression is heavily tied to negative connotations because the popular response from women has been to say, see, we're not so different from you guys. Women are actively supporting the patriarchal system by suppressing the daughters and the girl and by empowering the boys and the son. And while androgyny is certainly never a bad thing for males or females, there's something extra powerful when a woman embraces her femininity for positive impact pissed off. I used to ask my mother, why do we have to cover ourselves? What's wrong with being a woman? Why do we have to adapt to them and not the other way around? The only answer I got, because you are a girl. And it was like, yeah. He told me that people were saying that my novel was feminist. And his advice to me, and he was shaking his head sadly as he spoke, was that I should never call myself a feminist because feminists are women who are unhappy because they cannot find husbands. <laughs> so I decided to call myself a happy feminist. It's the same for race and sexual orientation. It can be extra powerful when someone embraces their heritage rather than suppressing it to blend in. Or when people break outdated gender norms as if to say, these pointless boundaries can't hold me back. Diversity is a beautiful thing, and I think more people really need to understand that. Bayonetta showcases the best attributes from this sort of mentality. She doesn't let outdated forms of oppression hold her back. She refuses to not acknowledge that she's a woman, and a feminine one at that. She's also extremely empathetic, taking great care of everyone she comes across, 
saving complete strangers, and eventually the entire multiverse. She is portrayed with motherly characteristics, not just in her design, but with the characters she's constantly forced around, and normally, I'm more of a fan of women breaking the mold and not being obligated to start a family, but there's something so elegant how Bayonetta speaks to and cares for the childlike figures in her life. She owns it. And that comes from her lack of the final character flaw, individuality. No matter how many people she cares for, no matter how many helpless children need her aid, and even after actually becoming a mother herself, Bayonetta retains her sense of individuality and expression. She doesn't care to dress like everyone around her. She doesn't act like a different person. She doesn't care to change herself because she knows she's perfectly fine as is, and she's comfortable being herself as it doesn't harm anyone around her. It's something a lot of us can learn from. I mean, seriously, how many times have you seen great female characters get thrown in the gutter the moment they have a child? Then that's all their character becomes about sometimes, and we lose any sense of the character that we once knew, like Chi-Chi from Dragon Ball. Heck, even Android 18, who used to be one of the most powerful villains in the show. Other positive depictions of powerful feminine women like Bayo are the Charmed Ones, Mei, the Mizukage from Naruto, Blossom from the Powerpuff Girls, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and even Cordelia Chase when she switches from Buffy to the spin-off series Angel. That's not to say these characters don't have any character flaws. Bayonetta has been shown to be overconfident at times. The Mizukage is scared of growing older and longs to get married before it's too late. Buffy's guilty of giving her power away by allowing herself to become emotionally vulnerable. But yet again, these are all realistic character flaws. And that's a huge part of why these characters are not only positive depictions, but enthralling characters to study and analyze. I'm fascinated with trends in media, and when writers and creators go out of their way to break boundaries. All my favorite works in entertainment do this. They're not afraid to show diverse takes of people and concepts. I'm sure I missed some awesome examples of good and bad feminine representation. So I think we'd all be happy to hear if you mention it down in the comments. And that brings me back to my original point of this video. Go play Nier Automata. Thanks for watching if you made it this far, and big thanks to my patrons on Patreon. You guys help make sure I get time and research for quality videos like this, and I can't thank you enough. If you're not a patron, please consider joining with the link in front of you, otherwise have even more fun watching my videos that I also have linked here. Enjoy everyone.